Hello, my name is Dr. Maria Ryan, and I serve as Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer at the Colgate Palmolive Company. And I'm really thrilled to welcome you uh, to our fifth episode of our LinkedIn series, Get to Know Your OQ with Colgate Palmolive. And I'm really, really pleased to have Dr. George Katsaris as our guest today, um, because we are coming to the end of February, which is Children's Dental Health Month. And uh, I'll give a brief introduction for George, and then, and it'll you'll understand why it's so great to have him here today. Uh, George is a psychologist with an interest in behavior change for health, and his work focuses on dynamic family behaviors and their impact for children's development and well-being. And George has been exploring the role and potential of digital technologies in behavior change. And today we'll be focusing on oral health behavior change for children and adults. George also co-leads the behavior change in public health module of the master's in public health, public health program at the University of Manchester. And he co-leads communication and behavior change teaching in the division of dentistry at Manchester. He's the co-founder and co-lead of the Be Kind Network, which is a network which focuses on behavior change in dentistry. He's a consultant on behavior change for us at Colgate Palmolive, as well as the BBC and the National Health Service in Scotland. He's completed uh, his undergraduate studies in psychology at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece and his postgraduate degree in clinical aspects of psychology at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. George's PhD focused on behavior uh, changes in families, particularly uh, bedtime routines, and their implication for child well-being and development, especially around children's dental health, their executive functioning, and school readiness. And in 2019, George became a chartered psychologist with the British Psychological Society. So welcome, George. It's really great that you're here. And, you know, before I start talking to you about the importance of behavior in children and, and their families, you know, it's just startling to me to look at some of the numbers that are coming out uh, from the World Health Organization and others looking at oral diseases with an estimated 3.5 billion people currently suffering from oral diseases, which is really half of the world's population. And if we think about childhood diseases, we often think about cavities and, and cavities remain the most common uh, and most prevalent uh, chronic disease among adults and children. And it's estimated that about 2.3 billion people suffer from tooth decay, with uh, 514 million children suffering from caries in their primary teeth. And so when we think about untreated dental caries or tooth decay in, in permanent teeth, it is the most common health condition according to the global burden of disease from 2019. And uh, we both know that research uh, shows that if you have caries as a child, it often continues throughout adulthood. And um, our, our Know Your OQ platform, uh, which is a public health uh, platform to educate people about the importance of oral health, uh, really talks about the impact of oral diseases throughout our life on not only our oral health, but our overall health and well-being. Um, and Colgate recently uh, did a study uh, looking at the social and emotional impacts uh, of caries on families and found that children experiencing issues uh, with their teeth um, in those families, uh, the kids and the parents, could miss up to two to three days of school and work over the year, and that cavities led to worry, anxiety, and sadness in both kids and their parents. So it's an important issue for us to address. 
and that this problem really persists with the World Health Organization finding that global cases of oral disease have increased by 1 billion over the past 30 years. So it's a clear sign that uh, change is needed in the way that we talk and think about oral health. And, and I think you're one of those change agents, George. So I'd like you to really talk about, you know, why we need to focus on children and some of the work that you're doing with children and their parents. Yes, absolutely. I think you outlined, Maria, how big of a challenge we have in our hands, really, with those numbers in the billions, how much suffering there is around oral health and dental decay in particular. But I think that is also a great opportunity because we can actually have a very meaningful, tangible benefit for all those people who actually suffer from caries and other oral health uh, conditions. When it comes to children, where is where I'm focusing my work and where a lot of the work is being done is, is a very particular group because we both need to get things right for them from an early start in life to make sure they have these foundations and they're good bases for future kind of development and well-being. And as you said, we know that if children have caries in an early age, those caries could carry on in later life, affecting their well-being, their development, their health, their kind of opportunities for life. So focusing on children is important for all those parameters, but it's also important when we think about it from a behavioral perspective, because the sooner we intervene in someone's life, the easier the intervention can be compared to someone who is in their late like 20, 30s, 40 year olds, where they have more established habits, things that they've been doing in a certain way for a number of years. And in those cases, we're gonna face a lot more resistance to change. Meanwhile, in the younger ages, like younger children who are still forming their habits, they're still learning about the world, figuring out their likes and dislikes, there is a, so much more of an opportunity there to teach them how, what, how to do things right, teach them how to do things right within their oral health or health uh, regimes and hygiene and carry those habits for a better life in the future. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I can say for you know, my own experiences, um, as we try to change habits when we're older, it's just much more difficult. And um, you know, really working with families and children to set good habits early on is so important. So can you talk to me a little bit about some of the work that you've done for, you know, modifying uh, habits in children to really um, set the course for good oral health as they move forward? So, yes, a lot of the work I've been doing here at Manchester University, focusing on children and family routines, we recognize how important routines are for overall health and well-being. And routines, some people might think of them as kind of rigid and restrictive because it might have more of a negative connotation for some people. But the reality is we all have routines in our day-to-day -day lives, from how we wake up in the morning, how we go off to bed at night. And if we actually utilize those routines we have in place, improve them and achieve optimal routines, then we can benefit on a whole host of areas from oral health. So imagine an oral health routine from morning to bedtime, diet, nutrition, behavioral routines, how parents and children interact with each other, creating bonding, stronger attachment, helping kind of the overall functioning of the family. So a lot of our work is on routines for that particular reason. And over the years, we first explored the area because there was quite a lack of evidence around routines. We knew they're important to some extent, but we've never really known how important they are for children's uh, development and well-being. So we undertook a bit of a scoping review of the area. We tried to set the scene and understand what is actually happening in families. From a UK perspective, but a lot of the findings from the UK could be kind of uh, reflected to the rest of kind of the Western world. So we saw that routines are very prevalent in families, and those routines in many cases are suboptimal. So the parents and the families and the children might not be doing things the right way, might be missing out things that are beneficial. So what we then did is we developed an intervention using a digital health uh, technology approach to minimize intrusiveness, communicate richer and more engaging messages to parents to help them and the children establish better routines. And what we saw through that intervention is that the better the routines got over time, the better the outcomes for the children. 
So in one of our studies that was funded by the Medical Research Council, we developed an intervention that we sent out to fairly deprived areas in Greater Manchester. And we saw that routines improved over the follow-up period. And as routines improved, children brushed their teeth more, they ate less sugar, they watched less TV and engaged less with electronic devices around bedtime. Parents and children came together, they read more, they communicated more, and all of that had a positive effect on parents' mood, on family functioning, and built very good basis for the routines to be optimal over a longer period of time and for the children to harness all the benefits of optimal routines. That's awesome. And, you know, it's I know that you were even interviewed on the news uh, based on your reports because the findings were so dramatic and it's so important considering the numbers that I you know, presented before. And, you know, we have a, a program called Bright Smiles, Bright Futures, uh, where we've reached out to um, 1.3 billion children worldwide. Um, really introducing them, uh, many of them for the first time, to the important habits they need to have early on for good oral health, brushing their teeth, using toothpaste with fluoride, and having behavioral changes. And as part of that program, we have uh, materials in over 30 languages that we give to parents and teachers and to children to get them to better understand the importance of oral health. And based on your work, we've added on to that program something called Smile O'Clock, which um, we were very happy that you were able to consult uh, with us on that program, which is really to encourage uh, nighttime brushing because of the findings that you know you have had. You know, George, I, I think it's really important for parents to really set the example for their kids. And so as we started out our conversation talking about uh, as we get older, the habits that we have and how to change them, um, a lot of that um, desire for change comes from um, health literacy. And we know that oral health literacy is so poor uh, throughout the world that we created Know Your Oral Health Quotient or Know Your OQ to really educate people about the importance of oral health to their overall health and well-being and to um, give them the information that they need as to why they need to take care of their oral health and how to have preventive strategies and um, where to seek care. Uh, and what the signs and symptoms of, of the diseases they may face are. And as we created it, we wondered, would we actually change behavior? And um, we were really happy that you conducted a study um, to really look at that. Would, would you care to speak about that and the importance of the parents in changing the children's health, them understanding the importance of oral health? Yeah, of course. And, and before I kind of summarize the data from the study you mentioned, Maria, just to highlight the need of a partnership approach when it comes to children's oral health, because children don't live in a vacuum, obviously. They're surrounded by parents, guardians, caregivers, and schools as well. So there's kind of a lot of uh, a lot of elements within children's routines, daily life, that could affect their oral health and also could be agents for change when it comes to children's oral health. That's why all of the work we've been doing and the work you've mentioned, focusing on the adults as well as the children, and providing information, educating people about the consequences of doing something versus not doing or the consequences of the care and actions is very important. It is always a fundamental and sometimes misstep when it comes to behavior change, because it's all fair to think about how we can change people's behaviors. But if people don't actually know what they need to change and how to do it properly, then it's a bit of a missed opportunity. So that's how, obviously, you know your OQ came along from, from you, from Colgate. And it's kind of, again, another it's another element of a whole host of kind of oral health and health literacy campaigns, but with a, quite of a unique approach, which is the digital approach, which could be quite agile and easily applicable to different populations. And obviously you mentioned, for example, Bright Smiles, Bright Future, and how widespread it is with different languages and adaptations. And that is, again, very crucial when we think about behavior change. It's making things relevant, easy, and attractive for the intended audience rather than copy-pasting the same approach from different cultures, different populations, different circumstances. 
So on the back of all this, uh, yes, we undertook a study at, with the University of Manchester, and that study took place in the US uh, a few months ago. And what we did is we delivered the no Euro Q, uh intervention to a sample of 300 adults from different backgrounds, demographics, ethnicities, socioeconomic statuses, to see if that approach were, was able to improve their knowledge, change their attitudes regarding oral health, and especially if it was able to shift some of their practices around oral health. Um, we established baselines with all of our participants, and unsurprisingly, we saw a great divide in terms of knowledge regarding oral health, with about only 20% of people knowing that oral health uh, and dental diseases are the most common disease in the world, about 50% of people are baseline using fluoride toothpaste or knowing the benefit about fluoride toothpaste. So what, what do you describe at the start of the conversation? A very widespread lack of information and awareness on the importance of oral health, common signs, symptoms, and what actually they need to do to take care of their oral health. So fortunately, what we saw through the intervention, through no EuroQ and a seven-day follow-up, so a week later, is that practices, knowledge and attitudes all improved on, on our uh, sample. And that is a very strong first indication that campaigns such as No Euro Q, even though at its current format is focusing on education and information provision primarily, but even that on its own can have a benefit in changing attitudes, changing knowledge, and both attitudes and knowledge could then trigger some changes in practices. Obviously, from a behavioral perspective, Telling people what to do or what not to do is important. But when we think about the sustained changes over a longer period of time, we might need to think about people's motivation to change, giving them all the necessary resources. So there are areas that could improve, as always. But I think that initial strong evidence that telling people what to do, giving them the information, empowering them through creating more literacy around oral health was important in creating better knowledge, better attitudes and changes in practices regarding oral health with adults. That's fabulous. You know, I, I know that um, your work on nighttime brushing has been published and you had that interview. So maybe we can post that along with this. And uh, also I know that the work that you're talking about looking at the impact of Know Your OQ is also going to be published. So hopefully as that comes out, we can publish that. So in closing, George, this has been really a, a, such a great conversation and so important because I really do think behavior change is essential to our success and the work that you're doing is so important. And so I usually ask everyone at the end to have some kind of call to action. You know, what are two or three things that our viewers can do or, or share with the people that they love or with their patients as to how they can move forward uh, to improve their oral health? So I'll say, bringing a bit of a behavioral background into this, I'll say, obviously, as many of your viewers might know, brush for twice a day, two minutes with fluoride toothpaste as a baseline, obviously. But from a behavioral perspective, I'll say start small. If you're not doing everything right, start small and build that over time because that can help you to achieve more sustained changes over a longer period of time. When it comes to children and parents, I'll say start from an early age with your children because, as we said, that can help them set good foundations and habits for life. And also make things engaging and make things fun for that particular age group, because that could create more of an engagement and easier kind of um, an easier routine in place. But yes, definitely stick to the basics of brushing twice a day, tw two minutes at a time with a fluoride toothpaste and start small and build bigger from that. Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic things for us to all consider. Um, and it's been really a pleasure, George, and we look forward to hearing your continued work in this area. And um, let's all work on our behavioral changes to uh, improve oral health and, and to probably do many other things that we need to do. So I think your, your final calls to action can be applied to other things as well. So appreciate that. All right. We look forward to seeing you all at our next um uh, episode of uh, Get to Know Your OQ with Colgate Palmolive. Thank you, Maria.